Major funding for war and peace in the nuclear age was provided by the Annenberg CPB project. Additional funding was provided by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for over 100 years providing business and personal insurance worldwide through independent agents and brokers. And by the W. Walton Jones Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, public television stations, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So we will use nuclear weapons whenever we feel it necessary to protect our vital interests. Our nuclear stockpile is several times out of the Soviet Union, and we will use either tactical weapons or strategic weapons in whatever quantities, wherever, whenever it's necessary to protect this nation and its interests. Nuclear warheads are not weapons. They have no military use whatsoever, excepting only to deter one's opponent from using nuclear weapons. USSR Armed Forces, Masters of Strategic Rockets. This is a recent graduating class of officers for the elite troops of the Soviet military, the Strategic Rocket Forces. These young soldiers will join the forces that operate the missiles aimed at the United States. Let us now step down into the silos where rocket men are on duty day and night, ready to go into action at a moment's notice in case of need. Land-based missiles are the largest component of the Soviet nuclear force and the centerpiece of Soviet strategy. The rocket forces are highly trained and better paid than other Soviet military forces. Most officers have an engineering or technical degree. In the late 1950s, the Soviets were the first in space, the first to develop missiles with intercontinental range. The rocket forces were founded shortly afterward, in 1959. The phrase, masters of strategic forces, has a proud ring, and it implies high responsibility. They protect the Soviet Union, the rest of the socialist community, with a reliable nuclear shield. The introduction of the missile into the Soviet arsenal forced a revolution in thinking about warfare. In the early 1960s, one man was given the daunting task of taking U.S. nuclear strategy into the missile age, Robert McNamara. In his 1960 presidential campaign, John F. Kennedy confronted the challenge of the early Soviet success with missiles. Why in the short space of 40 years has the Soviet Union been able to capture the imagination of the people? Why are we second in outer space? And a Gallup poll taken last February in nine of ten countries showed that a majority of people thought that the Soviet Union would be first in science in 1970 and first in military power. I'm not satisfied to be second in outer space and second to the moon. I have heard all the excuses. But I believe, not in an America, that is first but, first if, first when, but first period. Kennedy passed the challenge of the missile age to his new Secretary of Defense. All right, why don't we, uh, let me do some pictures afterwards. I have asked uh, Robert McNamara to assume the responsibilities of Secretary of Defense. And I'm glad and happy to say that he has accepted this responsibility. Mr. McNamara leaves the presidency of the Ford Company 
at great personal sacrifice. I was very reluctant to accept uh, President Kennedy's invitation to become Secretary of Defense, and I did so only on the condition that I would be allowed to, uh, to bring into the department the ablest people I could find. I clearly was not an expert on defense, and I felt I needed the brightest minds in the country to assist me to become an expert on defense, and I fully intended to be one. McNamara became an expert on defense, and a controversial one. He had instigated radical changes in management at Ford. He was confident he could do the same at defense. Cool, abrupt, and analytical, McNamara soon clashed with the military chiefs at the Pentagon. Is it not a fact that you foresee a situation where the forces you must lead would be inadequate? In my opinion, yes. Now, General Thomas Power believed the U.S. needed more bombers for his strategic air command. He was supported by the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Curtis LeMay, the famous bomber commander of World War II. Well, I would like to see a bomber production line going uh, until such time as we can get the B-70 program uh, uh, in production, because I firmly believe that we're going to need manned systems from here on out. McNamara listened not to these generals who fought the last war in bombers, but to academics who thought about the next war with missiles. I got my doctorate in economics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Alan Entevin became McNamara's assistant secretary of defense, analyzing weapons systems. Well, I went to MIT and got a degree in industrial engineering and then went to Oxford University. Henry Rowan became Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. He was concerned with the defense of Europe. I got my PhD in international relations at Yale. William Kaufman became a Pentagon consultant. He wrote position papers for McNamara. I had been a pure mathematical logician concerned with that and with the logic of science. Albert Wolstetter influenced many of these defense intellectuals. He was their mentor at RAND, an Air Force think tank in Santa Monica, California. While at RAND, Wolstetter wrote an important study on protecting U.S. power to strike back in the 1950s and 60s. He was concerned about the vulnerability of American nuclear forces to a Soviet surprise attack. Pearl Harbor served as Wolstetter's model. America entered World War II after a Japanese surprise attack destroyed the U.S. fleet there in 1941. The Pearl Harbor understood properly had a continuing relevance, especially in an age when so much power could be concentrated in, in, in an initial blow. Wolstetter warned that U.S. bombers were as vulnerable to a surprise bomber attack as the fleet had been at Pearl Harbor. In the 50s, the Strategic Air Command's bombers were America's nuclear strike force, which claimed it could deter a surprise attack. This is the mail fist of SAC, which has deterred aggression in the past. For only the threat of devastating retaliation can keep potential aggressors from starting a nuclear holocaust. SAC's threat of devastating retaliation assumed it could survive a Soviet bomber attack and strike back. Wolstetter doubted it could. Most of SAC's bombers were on the ground, many on bases near the Soviet Union lined up wingtip to wingtip, an easy target for bombers. The missile age heightened his concerns. If the Soviets launched missiles at each SAC base, SAC would be even more vulnerable to a surprise attack. The problem of deterring an all-out nuclear war has been greatly complicated by the introduction of intercontinental ballistic missiles into the arsenal of our major adversary in the world struggle. Only a year or so ago, the principal general war threat to our country was a, was a surprise attack by large numbers of nuclear-armed manned bombers. 
A year or two from now, our principal concern will be a surprise attack by large numbers of intercontinental ballistic missiles. McNamara bought the ideas of the defense intellectuals. Acting on their advice, he began a process of rethinking U.S. nuclear strategy and reshaping U.S. nuclear forces. The first step was a full-scale review of America's nuclear arsenal. The goal was to develop invulnerable forces which could survive a Soviet attack and strike back. The intellectual spoke the detached language of the think tank and rode roughshod over some of the military's favorite weapons. Alan Entevin took the lead. The strategy of the Kennedy administration was we want to make nuclear war unlikely in two ways. First, we need to have survivable, invulnerable strategic retaliatory forces so that if the Soviets were to strike us, our forces would survive the attack and be able to strike back in retaliation. And that's why right away we stopped production on the bombers, stopped a whole lot of weapon systems that were vulnerable. In 1955, the highest national priority was given to the development of the Atlas. The Atlas was our first uh, intercontinental ballistic missile based above ground, soft and concentrated, vulnerable to a Soviet missile attack canceled them, phased them out. Our first answer to the need for a long-range strategic missile was the SNARK. The SNARK combined some of the worst features of the bomber with the worst features of the missile. Vulnerable on the ground like the bomber, uh, couldn't be launched subject to recall, and slow time to target, unreliable like the missile. Canceled it. Is the super plane that is going to help aviation zoom into its supersonic future. This is the B-70. Six engines, each with a thrust of 30,000 pounds, make it the most advanced aircraft ever built. The B-70's problem is that it was extremely expensive, an easy mark for a Soviet surface-to-air missile, and vulnerable on the ground. Cancelled it. McNamara's defense intellectuals also limited production of the B-52 long-range bomber. They phased out the B-58, a new supersonic bomber. They junked 1,800 B-47s. The Air Force fought the changes bitterly. But the golden era of the bomber was over. Those were tense years. They were years of change, and dramatic change is always resisted by the military. Not for some stilted, uh, nonsensical reason, but the people who are responsible for the military are almost a father image for millions of people. The LeMays of the times and the powers, they knew that. And you don't just go around changing things like you change a, an academic paper or an academic premise. There are millions of people affected by that, real people. I remember once uh, Tommy Power, the commander in chief of the Strategic Air Command, talking to me and saying, Alan, we've built this magnificent flying organization, and now uh, you're destroying it. I'd say, I know, Tommy, and I, I think it's terrible. I really am sorry, but, but the strategic requirements of the United States, the advancement of technology, just demand that we go to survivable, protected, retaliatory power, and that appears to be best done with Minuteman missiles in s concrete and steel silos underground and Polaris missiles in submarines under the sea. McNamara scrapped the vulnerable systems and speeded up production of the Minuteman intercontinental missile. They were deployed in underground silos, hardened to withstand anything other than a direct hit. A survivable second strike force meant going underground. And underwater. The Kennedy Pentagon put the production of the Polaris submarine-launched missile system on overtime. New might for Uncle Sam's deterrent power. The nuclear submarine John Adams is set for launching at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the 16th Polaris-firing submarine to join the fleet. At Groton, Connecticut, the 17th of this mighty fleet is launched as the Nathan Hale joins the John Adams. 
The count of America's atomic submarine stands at 25 as the daughter of Thomas Edison prepares to christen the 400-foot Polaris-carrying underwater craft. Down the way she goes. By late 1964 or early 1965, we'll have 29 in commission. McNamara's men got the invulnerable weapons they wanted to deter a Soviet attack on America. But what if the Soviet bloc attacked Europe? The fighting men of Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, the German Democratic Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and the Soviet Union stand united. They perfect their fighting skill at joint exercises. The U.S. was committed to defending Europe. It feared the Soviets and their allies could overrun the continent in a conventional war. In the 50s, President Eisenhower had countered this with the threat of massive nuclear retaliation. And the strategy at that time, as it related to Europe, was what was called massive retaliation. It was thought that the conventional forces would serve as a tripwire, the, almost the smallest conceivable Soviet uh, incursion into NATO territory uh, would trip that wire, trip the conventional forces, if you will, and lead to an all-out nuclear assault upon the Soviet Union. So the first question we had to ask ourselves in 1961, was this a viable strategy? And uh, if so, were the forces adequate? And we very quickly came to the conclusion it wasn't a viable strategy. The main reason for rejecting the Eisenhower administration reliance on nuclear weapons, which was based on the uh, Soviet superiority on the ground, conventional forces, was the growth in the Soviet nuclear capacity. Uh, it was all very well in the early 50s when the United States had, still had a, well, initially a monopoly and then a, a near monopoly of nuclear weapons to say we were going to use them if it was an attack because we couldn't be retaliated against. But by the early 60s, we, it was clear that we could be retaliated against. It wasn't such a, an attractive policy. McNamara planned a new strategy for defending Europe that did not depend on massive retaliation. But it was still being drafted when a European crisis arose in Berlin. The attention of an anxious world is focused on East and West Germany and Berlin. The last great exodus of refugees from the East is processed in the Marienfelde Center as the communist German regime moves to close their border against further flights. Since World War II, Berlin had been a Western outpost, a mecca for refugees, a hole in the Iron Curtain in the middle of communist East Germany. The West's access to Berlin from West Germany was threatened in the spring of 1961. Soviet Premier Khrushchev raised the threat when he met President Kennedy at a summit meeting in Vienna, six months after Kennedy took office. Well, at the end of that summit meeting, Mr. Khrushchev, in very harsh terms, presented an ultimatum to President Kennedy about Berlin. He said that he was going to make an agreement with the East Germans under which the East Germans would have control over the access routes to Berlin. And um, then he said, if there's any attempt on the part of the West uh, to interfere with these arrangements, there will be war. Well, now, in diplomacy, you don't use that word war very often. You talk about the gravest possible consequences or something of that sort. But Kennedy had to look Khrushchev straight in the eye and say, then, Mr. Chairman, there will be war. It's going to be a very cold winter. The NATO shield was long ago extended to cover West Berlin. And we have given our word that an attack upon that city will be regarded as an attack upon us all. We intend to have a wider choice than humiliation or all-out nuclear action. In a tense meeting at Hyannis, Kennedy and his advisors planned some limited nuclear options but they gambled first on a show of conventional force. Military buildup in the United States is moving into high gear. At Camp Pickett, Virginia, members of the Pennsylvania National Guard, the nation's largest, are undergoing intensive training. 
Increasing the draft and calling up the reserves did not make the defense of Berlin any more tenable, but it was a clear sign of commitment. Berlin had become, in Kennedy's words, the great testing place of Western courage and will. Many Americans felt the same. I definitely feel that we have to stop them because uh, if we don't stop them now, we don't know where else they'd go. They definitely have to be stopped and we should defend it at all costs. I think if it comes to a war, we should go to war to defend it, yes. Because we've given them ground in other areas and I think that this is a, a final test of how much we'll take from the Kremlin. Basic With the eyes of the world on Berlin, McNamara threatened nuclear war. Well, do you mean to imply, sir, that uh, you would then perhaps use nuclear weapons in connection with the Berlin situation? Yes, I, I definitely do. We will use nuclear weapons whenever we feel it necessary to protect our vital interests. Our nuclear stockpile is several times out of the Soviet Union, and we will use either tactical weapons or strategic weapons in whatever quantities, wherever, whenever it's necessary to protect this nation and its interests. The Allies never had to face the nuclear options in Berlin. In August 1961, Khrushchev built a wall around West Berlin. That solved most of his problem. It reduced the embarrassing flow of refugees from the east to a trickle. Kennedy's resolve assured continued access to Berlin for the U.S. and her allies. A major crisis of the nuclear age was over. Its lessons were not lost on McNamara. Uh, it was increasingly apparent to the Soviets we were unlikely to respond to, let's say, uh, their pressure on Berlin in August of 61 with an all-out launch against the Soviet Union, an all-out launch of our strategic offensive weapons, when we knew that were we to do that, uh, the remaining Soviet forces would be launched against us and would destroy us. That's not a credible deterrent. You cannot make a credible deterrent out of an incredible action. And massive retaliation by the early 60s was an incredible action. McNamara proceeded with a more credible strategy to defend Europe than massive retaliation. He proposed to NATO an approach that relied mainly on conventional weapons. It was called flexible response. The concept of flexible response was the first change in NATO strategy really since 1949. We tried to get away from the idea of automatic massive retaliation as uh, Foster Dulles appeared to believe in, to uh, a ladder of escalation in which you wouldn't use nuclear weapons until your troops were being overrun. You would build up your conventional forces to be certain that you would never need to use nuclear weapons except against a major deliberate invasion. And then you would use them in discrete steps. A Soviet bloc invasion of Western Europe would most likely be through West Germany. The new strategy was to counter it with strengthened NATO conventional forces. As a last resort, only if NATO conventional forces were in danger of being overrun, NATO would respond with tactical or battlefield nuclear weapons. If the Soviet Union retaliated against NATO's reserve forces in West Germany, NATO might then bomb the Soviet bloc backup forces in Poland. An attempt would be made to end the war after each step in the ladder of escalation. Under flexible response, Europe would again be the battleground. World War II had destroyed much of Europe. Another conventional war would be just as devastating. A limited nuclear war would be worse. Flexible response worried many Europeans. To them, 
this new strategy made war more likely. Under massive retaliation, if the Soviet bloc attacked Western Europe, it ran the risk of a NATO attack on the Soviet Union itself. A Soviet retaliation against the U.S. is what worried McNamara. But for many Europeans, the horror of a war engulfing the two superpowers would deter the Soviets from ever attacking Europe. War should be considered upon to be, should be looked upon to be uh, as terrible as, as our fantasy can imagine it. And I think then we shall have a more peaceful period in the next hundred years than we had in the last century. Uh, when Mr. McNamara says, I am a very reasonable man, you know, and I try to make a limited, nu limited war, and if we go up to the nuclear level, we will be very reasonable, and our first strike will be a limited strike, which we, in fact, be uh, across, a, a shot across the bow, you see. Uh, he lowers the level of deterrence. It took McNamara five years to convince his European colleagues to adopt his flexible response strategy. But he felt they never built enough conventional forces to lower NATO's dependence on nuclear weapons. Uh, the threshold of nuclear war was not raised as high as we believe desirable. And to this day, it is far lower than I find acceptable. There is an unacceptable risk of nuclear war today because NATO has failed to carry out the strengthening and conventional forces which we recommended uh, in April of 1962. And the NATO commanders will say today, and have said publicly, that they would expect in the early hours of any military confrontation between East and West to request authority to use nuclear weapons. I think that's a disgraceful state of affairs. McNamara also sought an alternative to total nuclear war between the superpowers. Under massive retaliation, missiles like this Titan would head for Soviet cities, bombers for other targets. McNamara introduced options to fight a limited nuclear war. In doing this, he confronted the central question of the nuclear age. Can nuclear weapons be used in a controlled way? One option was to avoid cities and strike military targets. The plan was William Kaufman's. The attacks, especially right off the bat on cities, virtually guaranteed that your own cities would be attacked. Therefore, uh, you really wanted to uh, avoid those cities uh, in order not, not just to be a nice guy, uh, nuclear weapons don't sort of go along with being a nice guy uh, but because you wanted to try and limit damage to your own cities so it was very important to have a variety of possible uses less than uh, total total use of these weapons and uh, that point was urged on McNamara and he accepted that in a pivotal statement in the evolution of nuclear strategy, McNamara made this idea public in his 1962 commencement address at Ann Arbor, Michigan. A central military issue facing NATO today is the role of nuclear strategy. And the U.S. has come to the conclusion that basic military strategy in a possible general nuclear war should be the destruction of the enemy's military forces and not of his civilian population. One purpose of the speech was to say to the Soviets that uh, it would be our hope that the initial exchange could be limited to uh, a relatively small number of warheads focused on military targets and that after that in some fashion the, uh, the war could be terminated. This idea, also called counterforce, was an attempt to establish rules of the game to keep nuclear war limited. But the opponent has to agree. And in the early 60s, the Soviets had neither enough missiles nor missiles accurate enough to pinpoint military targets and avoid cities. They also doubted a limited war would stay limited. It is not possible, first of all, to make the rules of the game. In a, in, a, in a nuclear exchange, because in the nuclear exchange you impose 
the rules of the game. You couldn't agree in advance. You could agree in advance about banning nuclear weapons, about not using nuclear weapons, but how to use them you couldn't agree because the losing side would never follow some rules that it agreed beforehand. There is no such thing as a limited nuclear conflict. It cannot be. It's impossible to fight a nuclear war gentleman style. If a nuclear war starts, it will become a total world war in no time. Unlike the Soviets, the U.S. Air Force liked the Ann Arbor Doctrine. The Air Force has always espoused a counterforce doctrine. Um, the Air Force was very pleased at the early indications uh, uh, during the 60s of support for what they considered to be the only legitimate role uh, for, for military forces, and that is to put at risk, and if you become engaged, to destroy or to render impotent the military forces uh, of an enemy. This counterforce doctrine meant that as Soviet forces grew, the U.S. would need more and more missiles to counter them. McNamara was shocked at how many the generals wanted when he and President Kennedy visited Vandenberg Air Force Base in the spring of 1962. General uh, Tommy Power, commander of the Strategic Air Command, met us on the airstrip. The general said to the president, now, Mr. President, when we get the 10,000 men in my will, and at that, pres that point, President Kennedy said, General, what did you say? Well, he said, you didn't let me say it. I was just getting started. I said, when we get the 10,000 minute men, we will. The president said, I thought that's what you said. But Bobby said, we're not ordering 10,000 minute men, are we? I said, no, Mr. President, we're ordering uh, 1,000. I mention this because that particular officer had recommended that we procure 10,000. The Air Force uh, chief had cut that back, as I recall, from 10,000 to 3,000, and he was recommending 3,000, and I had recommended 1,000 to the president. And that was the number we procured, and by God, that's the number we have today. Air Force demands strained the budget, and McNamara had to ask, how much is enough? He calculated what the U.S. needed to absorb a surprise attack, retaliate, and still destroy the Soviet Union. This set a ceiling on the size of the U.S. force. If the Soviets launched a surprise attack against the U.S., they would destroy some of the 1,000 Minutemen missiles. But enough could survive, strike back, and destroy at least 50% of Soviet cities and industry. U.S. submarines would have the same capability. So would the bomber force. For this triad of forces, McNamara chose numbers high enough so each leg had this same assured destruction capability. The cornerstone of our strategic policy continues to be to deter a nuclear attack upon this country or its allies and to accomplish this by maintaining an ability to inflict an unacceptable level of damage upon any aggressor at any point in a nuclear exchange, even though that aggressor strikes us first with the full weight of their force. This is what we mean by our assured destruction capability, the capability to respond with a level of power so great as to destroy the aggressor. McNamara, rather arbitrarily, came up with these numbers, I mean, that you could deter any rational decision to destroy the United States, to attack the United States, if Soviet leadership uh, understood that no matter what the course of a nuclear war, the United States would be able to destroy 50 percent of the Soviet urban population and a comparable fraction, or a little more actually, of Soviet industry. Assured destruction was a capability to destroy Soviet cities, not a new plan to do so. SAC planners would have enough weapons to allow retaliation against the numerous military targets. The Ann Arbor options to avoid cities and fight a limited nuclear war remained. But McNamara was losing faith in limited war. His doubts began with the scare of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. He feared then that even the most limited nuclear exchange would devastate the U.S. This conviction grew as Soviet forces expanded in the 60s.
uh, a small percentage of the Soviet force, which was much smaller than ours at the end of the 60s, but must have been on the order of, oh, I don't forgotten what, but say 1,500, 1,800, a relatively small percentage of that, say 20% of that, launched against uh, this country would, uh, for all practical purposes, destroy our nation. So at that point, limiting the uh, size of the, the launch uh, was relatively unimportant. What was important was never, never, never initiating the launch. That's the way to avoid nuclear war. Don't ever start it. As Soviet forces grew in the 60s, McNamara remained confident the forces he planned could deter a Soviet surprise attack. He lost confidence a nuclear war could be controlled. There were no more speeches on war fighting like Ann Arbor, only reiterations of the need to avoid nuclear war. This was a turning point in the education of Robert McNamara. Many defense intellectuals turned against him. The fact is that we were still very much dependent on the uh, threat to use nuclear weapons in, first in response to a Soviet attack against Europe. And here the Secretary of Defense was saying that very likely any such use would result in total catastrophe for the United States and for Western Europe and for the Soviet Union. The chances that we would do that uh, were very, very small, that we would actually use them if we saw it would be zero if we thought that was going to happen. And the worry was that the Europeans and the Soviets also could perceive that. And it was uh, kind of bad for the deterrence of the Soviet Union and bad for the health of the alliance to be going around saying these things. It's quite true that, that uh, destruction is possible, but to say that that can't be affected by the will of either side as to whether it will actually occur in a war seems to me to be a grave error. It doesn't mean we, we uh, wouldn't have a measured response, but uh, we did not believe, as the forces grew large, that a measured response uh, uh, would lead to uh, any significant reduction in destruction of our society. How do you make threats to respond that are believable if you're if you're if you're saying you're going to respond by le unleashing uncontrollable destruction that would engulf you as well? You take a step to assure your destruction when you initiate the use of nuclear weapons. And nobody can tell you how you can avoid that once you initiate it. Not Wolstead or not anybody. When President Kennedy went to Dallas on November 22, 1963, the concept of assured destruction was new, its meaning unexplored. Kennedy simply planned to say that he had delivered on his campaign promise to make America stronger. But I believe not in an America that is first but, first if, first when, but first period. Kennedy left America stronger with a second strike force, a force for deterrence. Under a new president, McNamara had to face a new challenge. McNamara's strategy was to deter the Soviets from ever launching a missile attack by the threat of retaliation. But deterrence could fail. Was it possible to build a defense against incoming Soviet missiles? Now that meant that we would have to develop a missile that could knock down another missile. And in 1952, when that was first proposed, why well, everyone said it's impossible. They used the term, you can't hit a bullet with a bullet. Well, I didn't know whether you could or you couldn't, but I felt that you, we should study the problem. In the early 60s, McNamara agreed. He supported the Nike Zeus, a defensive missile. 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Any missile work any, on any missile development? We're proceeding with the development of the Nike Zeus as rapidly as it can possibly be developed. It's an exceedingly important part of our development program. The Nike Zeus, an anti-ballistic missile system, was soon ready to test. The target missile would be launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California toward Kwajalein Atoll in the Pacific, more than 4,000 miles away. On Kwajalein, the interceptor was in place. At Vandenberg, the target missile was ready to launch. The Zeus system, after finding the target, had less than three minutes to track it, determine a point of intercept, and launch the interceptor missile. Ten out of 14 tests were successful. A bullet could hit a bullet. So in a technical sense, in a narrow technical sense, the system worked and was an, an a great achievement in engineering. From an operational point of view, it was found very seriously wanting because it could handle only a limited number of targets and it seemed so easy for the enemy, for the Soviets, in this case, to load up their ballistic missiles with a lot of junk, decoys, jammers, a lot of, re a lot of bombs. And the Nike Zeus can easily be saturated, exhausted, and deceived. A new ABM system was developed to succeed the Nike Zeus, called Nike X. It had a more sophisticated radar system and two interceptors. The Spartan missile would intercept an incoming missile in space. If it missed, Sprint missiles would intercept in the atmosphere. In the mid-60s, the hopes for defending the United States from a missile attack lay with the Nike X. But McNamara began to question the usefulness of this expensive ABM system. The technology required to develop an anti-ballistic missile system is available to us. The question is whether we can develop it in such a way as to provide sufficient protection to our population as to warrant the very substantial expenditures associated with its deployment. General Glenn Kent presented McNamara the results of a Pentagon study. My conclusion after participating and running this study for six months was that there was every prospect that you could indeed uh, have 70 percent of the population in the United States survive a Soviet nuclear attack. Well, studies that showed uh, 70 percent survival showed by definition uh, 30 percent loss and 30 percent loss of say 200 million people in this country is 60 million. The Soviets would perhaps not sit still. What if the Soviets increased their arsenal? Uh, what would we have to do in order to still have 70 percent surviving? That part of it, I must admit, was discouraging because it showed that on the margin, if the Soviets spent a billion dollars to create more damage to the United States and had a policy to do so, that uh, <clears throat> we would have to spend something like three billion dollars on our measures to protect the United States in order to stay at 70 percent surviving. And I couldn't conceive of us therefore uh, benefiting from, from expending funds uh, to ensure that the loss was quote only unquote uh, 60 million and we didn't. And of course there are some of our so-called intelligentsia that think that's right. We shouldn't have a defense. It's too costly. And we never can make it perfect. We don't need it to make it perfect. In other words, if we can get a defense that's 60 to 80 percent effective, it will give the Kremlin a lot to think about if they're considering a first strike. In other words, they not only have to worry about how many the missiles they can knock out, but also how many of theirs we will knock out in the defense. McNamara rejected these arguments of the military, but the debate over ABM was not over. The Soviets, like the U.S. military, placed a high premium on defense. A small citizen sleeps peacefully, lulled by the tender songs of his mother.
Get stronger, young citizen. May your life be full of light and joy. This soldier doesn't sleep. The people entrusted him with the most precious thing, the defense of the motherland. Be vigilant for the sake of peace, Soviet troops. Defense, we are, we are a defense-minded people, you see. For the long time we've been defense-minded, not only as a Soviet people, but as a Russian people. So, for us, you see, building up of defense is nothing, is normal thing. The Soviets already had a defense against bombers. But when the Soviets began to deploy a defense against missiles, political pressure in the U.S. to do the same grew intense. From a military standpoint, General, uh, what, how broad a system of defense uh, would the Joint Chiefs like to see? How many cities in the United States would you say should be defended? The Joint Chiefs of Staff have advocated an area defense of, of uh, most of the continental United States, that is the lower 48. All we're saying is, Mr. President, Secretary McNamara, make a decision to proceed with deployment. This will not cost any more money this year than what the President re has recommended. But we say time is of the essence. We do not intend at this time to produce or deploy such a system. That we do intend to discuss with the Soviet Union possible restrictions on such deployments that would be in the interest of each of our nations. Actions that would act to dampen down what otherwise would be both a very costly and we believe a very wasteful escalation of the arms raid. In June 1967, McNamara and President Johnson met Soviet Premier Kosygin at Glassboro, New Jersey to discuss the Vietnam War. They also tried to convince him that both sides should abandon efforts to defend against missiles. And the president was becoming very, very frustrated seeking to make his argument uh, with Kosygin. Finally, uh, he turned to me and said, Bob, uh, for God's sakes, you tell uh, Kosygin what's wrong with their plan. So I said, if you proceed with that anti-ballistic missile system deployment, our response will not be, should not be, to deploy a similar system. That would be a waste. I hope we don't do that. But our response will be to expand our offensive weapons in order that we may maintain that deterrent. In order that, after you strike us, we'll now have sufficient weapons to launch against you, to penetrate your defense, accepting that some of them will be destroyed by that defense, and a sufficient number will penetrate to inflict unacceptable damage on you. That will be what we will do. It's not in our interest or your interest to do that. The way to stop that is for both of us to agree today that we will engage in talks leading to a treaty that will prohibit deployment of anti-ballistic missile systems, and which, by the way, we hope will be followed by a treaty that will limit offensive systems. He absolutely exploded. The blood rose into his face, his, his veins swelled, he pounded the table, and he said he, he could barely talk, he was so emotional. He said, defense is moral, offense is immoral. And he believed it. And uh, probably we have been educated by McNamara. We have been educated that who showed that in the nuclear age, the difference between um, offense and defense actually ceases to exist. And we started to think really in, in, a, in a quite a new way. McNamara did influence Soviet thinking at Glassboro. Though a treaty banning anti-ballistic missiles was five years away, the seeds were sown at Glassboro. The security of the West would lie not in defense, but in deterrence through the threat of retaliation. It was a formidable threat. On April 27, 1967, the last of the Minutemen intercontinental missiles was deployed. It was number 1,000. 54 of the larger and older Titan missiles were in place. All the missiles were underground, in concrete silos, invulnerable. 
There were also 650 B-52 bombers with intercontinental range. In July 1966, the Will Rogers was christened. It was the last of 41 Polaris submarines, the most invulnerable weapons system the world had seen. 41 submarines, each with 16 launchers, a total of 656 submarine-based missiles. With sea, land, and air-based weapons, the U.S. had an assured destruction capability, a secure second strike force. It could survive a surprise attack and still destroy the Soviet Union. In the late 1960s, the Soviets were developing a similar triad of forces. They built submarines with intercontinental missiles. They had bombers capable of reaching the U.S. and returning. The system the Soviets favored the most was missiles, underground, in hardened silos, invulnerable. The Soviets were developing an assured destruction capability, a secure second strike force. It could survive a surprise attack and still destroy the West. The blunt fact is then that neither the Soviet Union nor the United States can't attack the other without being destroyed in retaliation. And it's precisely this mutual capability for destruction that provides us both with the strongest possible motives to avoid a nuclear war. Since the 1960s, the survival of Soviets has depended upon restraint by Americans. The survival of Americans has depended upon restraint by Soviets. Each side is deterred by the threat of retaliation. The legacy of the McNamara years is a standoff called MAD, mutual deterrence through mutually assured destruction. We are absolutely against the notion that it's a desirable condition. We only consider it's a, it's an, a, a natural condition as of this moment because of the this uh, arms race of the 40 years before that. We came to the situation that we really have a situation of parity. And by parity, one each side guarantees that, that uh, the other side would not make aggression because the other side is capable of, uh, of making a devastating retaliation. It would be a mistake to throw that away, that deterrence away, before we have something better. And what that something better is, no one has been able to say. There have been various claims. Some think unilateral disarmament is better. Some think that a perfect defense is better and achievable. But no one's been able to show that anything better is achievable. President Johnson awarded McNamara the Medal of Freedom in February 1968. By then, the Vietnam War dominated McNamara's attention. When his support for the war wavered, he and Johnson parted. On behalf of your fellow Americans, all of them, your country salutes you. Robert McNamara had become an expert on defense and a controversial one. The conclusions he drew on the role of nuclear weapons focus the strategic debate today. There were certain individuals then and there are today who believe nuclear warheads are weapons that they can be used in military operations. That is absolutely wrong. Nuclear warheads are not weapons. They have no military use whatsoever, excepting only to deter one's opponent from using nuclear weapons. When he began his career, McNamara had sought to use nuclear weapons in a limited way. But seven years in the Pentagon convinced McNamara this could not be done. <laughs> 
not without unleashing a total nuclear war. This program was produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for war and peace in the nuclear age was provided by the Annenberg CPB project. Additional funding was provided by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for over 100 years providing business and personal insurance worldwide through independent agents and brokers and by the W. Walton Jones Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, public television stations, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. War and Peace in the Nuclear Age is a college course with textbooks published by Alfred A. Knopf. For information about the television course and related video cassettes, books, and off-air taping rights, Call the Annenberg CPB project at 1-800-LEARNER. The companion book to War and Peace in the Nuclear Age is now available, written by John Newhouse and published by Alfred A. Knopf. The 512-page hardcover can be ordered by calling 1-800-441-3000, $24.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready. In May 1972, President Richard Nixon, an ardent anti-communist, went to Moscow to sign the first superpower arms pact of the nuclear age. With this step, we have enhanced the security of both nations. Behind the handshakes and champagne, the tense drama of nuclear arms negotiations, next time on War and Peace in the Nuclear Age. <laughs>